in watercolor class. So this project will be about making a trompe l'oeil painting. And just to, just to um, review what that means exactly, a lot of people have heard that term, French word, uh, just means fool the eye. So technically any, any kind of uh, illusion you're making, you know, when you're representing three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface, you're, you're fooling the eye to some extent, but trompe l'oeil really draws attention to that. So it would be maybe placing an illusion on an illusion. Uh, so that's, that's basically the idea that we're going to pursue. It's, it's just kind of fun. It's sort of trick, you know, it's just sort of a, um, a game that tricks the eye a little bit or, or changes one's expectations. So this uh, image that I have uh, is of, this is Mrs. Milkershman, my great, great grandmother who died, you know, in the, uh, I believe before 1900. Anyway, um, she, uh, I have this cameo picture and that would be an interesting kind of thing to do this, um, you know, literally represent if you were, uh, with Trump law, you, you're forcing the perspective. So you might make a, a painting of this painting in the frame of this photograph in the frame. And that would be kind of Trump law because you're, you're suggesting that, oh yeah, the, the, the actual frame is an illusion as well. So we're doing something like this where you have, you make a painting of the photograph in the frame with something resting on it and then casting a shadow. So you paint, everything like that. So you're kind of undermining this illusion by putting another illusion over it. And then they're showing that uh, this is a flat surface um, that represents something three-dimensional. And you know that it's flat because you have another object that's casting a shadow onto it. So that would be trompe l'oeil. So my uh, strategy then is to, I'm gonna just do something. I, it, I'm interested in this picture. I don't wanna do the whole frame uh, I don't want to do the entire cameo, but I'm going to do like kind of a portion of it. But I thought it'd be interesting to kind of wreath her head with this blue tape that I'm using. So, so basically kind of make a wreath around her head or like a bonnet, making a bonnet for Mrs. Milkishman. I'm told that she was, she looks very severe, but I'm told she was actually a very, very kind woman, so she wouldn't mind that I'm putting a bonnet, a, a, a tape wreath or bonnet around her head. Anyway, with this tape, I'm deliberately kind of putting it on so that it has dimensionality to it. It's casting shadows onto that flat kind of glass covered surface. So that's gonna be my, that will be my illusion. The fact that I have this three-dimensional tape There, there's a bonnet on Mrs. Milkerschmann. There, kind of a wreath too. Uh, so here's, you know, here's sort of another form of memento mori, but it's, you know, potentially kind of funny. So what I'm gonna do is try to paint the uh, dimensionality of the tape. So then, so therefore there, there's kind of a separation and I'm gonna show how the tape is casting shadows onto the frame. So that's my plan. Um, any number of things that one could do, but typically you're trying to set up a relatively shallow space and then have objects within that shallow space where and, and, and kind of direct frontal view basically, but kind of layer objects into that shallow space to kind of undermine one's sense of, of um, uh, undermine, kind of undermine one's sense of, um, you know, uh, the illusion, like you sort of thwart what the expectations are by adding additional illusions over the existing illusion. Okay. So rather than paint the, the rather than literally paint directly from the uh, portrait, frame portrait, I took a photograph of it and then, uh, and cropped it. Um, I'm not up to doing the entire frame, but there are still uh, elements of it that are visible. 
but really the illusion I want to focus on uh, is just the tape around the head. So now I have a photograph that I'm going to work from that features, uh, you know, features the tape and uh, and it's sort of separation from the surface that is taped on. So that's that's going to be the crucial element. The shadow that the tape casts on the photograph and then the also the um, highlights and shadows within the the tape because of the way that it's applied that's what will create the illusion that's what i'm going to focus on so it's going to be all about edges so of course the first thing to do is to draw it and i've drawn it already so i'm going to work stand this up and i'm going to make a drawing I already made the drawing and then uh, i'm i'm kind of calculating what that's going to mean to paint around the edges of this tape. Uh, mostly it's a sepia kind of color, sepia here, sepia there. And then the tape is obviously blue. Well, that's gonna be really hard for me to kind of uh, paint this portrait within, uh, within the edges of the tape and outside the edges of the tape without you know, really uh, having to struggle a little bit. So I'm gonna use a masking device. Um, and yeah, I'm mean, gonna use the tape as a masking device. So I'm literally gonna tape out, I've already drawn the contours of the tape. So I'm gonna tape that out um, and then work around it. So I'm literally masking it off and then I'll just kind of work around it and that will preserve my edges. Now this could be done, uh, this is a painter's tape. It's got not a lot of adhesive on it. So it will pull off without taking the paper up provided the paper is absolutely completely dry um, when you're, uh, before you actually try to peel the, the tape up. Um, then you can use liquid masking fluid, which also uh, works pretty well. Uh, one of the other item would, if you were going to be masking off, would be a good thing to use. If you have um, masking tape, literally masking tape, kind of that uh, lighter, kind of very, very pale masking tape, kind of like this color, that would be something you might um, take a strip off of and then get the lint, put it on your pant leg or something and get a little bit of lint on it first. That happened off camera, but I was literally um, kind of here, getting a little lint on the tape, then pulling it up, then putting it down just that much um, that much kind of interference allows the tape to be lifted up earlier. So just be careful about that. You don't want to bond. Uh, if you're using some kind of masking device, you don't want to bond it permanently with a surface because you want to be able to peel it up. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, tape, uh, tape this on. Now this already releases pretty well. So I'm going to follow the contours of my tape. And I can't just lay the tape down flat. There, there's a contour there's a contour um, because of the way the tape curves and wrinkles and so on. So it's not just a, a line that I tape around. It's got to have a thickness and thinness. So I have to be really careful about that. So I'm just using this. I have a knife too that I can sort of gently cut off sections too. So I'm just building up. With the tape in order to get my um, the exact profile of my of my contour line that I've worked pretty hard to um, create already. Just using the exacto blade just very lightly to get the kind of contour that I want. There. So I want to just proceed with this and, and just lay it all in so that I have everything masked out. And then I can just paint and not worry about covering over the surface because it's really critical that I get the tape to separate a little bit from from the background. So I'm just gonna take some time to do that. 
and then begin painting once, once I have it all filled in. Okay, it was worth taking the time to tape off these contours. And then you can see why I, you, one can't just lay one strip of tape all the way around because that would undermine the illusion. The illusion requires that the tape gets, uh, the contour of that line gets thick and then it gets thin based on whatever angle or fold is in the tape. So now I'm ready to uh, work on the background. And generally speaking, when it's kind of a planned project like this, you work from the background back to front. So I'm gonna work on the background. And then I'm noticing that the whole thing is uh, kind of a sepia tone and it's got this nice kind of yellowish ochre base. So I could just, I just kind of lay in that base and then um, that'll be what I paint on top of. And you can see how the, the tape resists the, uh, kind of resists the, the water and the pigment. So I don't really have to worry about anything. I'm throwing a little bit of this kind of earthy ochre red, rust red that I'm throwing in there. And basically the whole background can be that color. And then I can just layer on top of it. This just creates a nice rich sort of tone surface to to work on top of. I'm using this, um, this is a Sumi brush. It just has longer, longer bristles, longer fibers so that I can just get more paint on there quickly. By the way, before, if you're, if you're taping anything off, if you're masking anything off, it's a good idea to just go around the edges and make sure it's really sealed well before you start painting. And then I believe I've mentioned it before, <clears throat> but you know, it's if you want your paper to buckle less, just tape it, tape the borders, and it'll buckle less. And then to really get it to dry absolutely flat, you can never keep it from buckling a little bit while you're working on it. But to get it to dry absolutely flat, you would need to um, stretch the paper, which I will demonstrate later. But rather than ha uh, tape it down dry, you would first get it all wet so that the paper fibers expand and flatten. And then, um, and then in its, it is kind of expanded position. Then you get uh, wet on wet tape, like a surgical tape works really good. And then, um, then you can tape around, you know, just blot all the water off it, tape it down. And then when it dries, it'll be tight as a drum because it, it's kind of pulling against the tape. And, uh, flattening out so we can that's that's something that a lot of people who paint in watercolor do kind of uh, just as a as a you know just as a general starting point you know you just stretch your paper but it just one more step that keeps one from painting so we're not focusing on that too much for the moment um i'm not really concerned about the, there's these light reflections in the, uh, my original has these light reflections here. I don't know, I don't know if that's worth doing. Um, I don't know that it enhances the image any, so I'm just not gonna include them. But anyway, um, when this dries, you know, I, I know that I can paint right over the top of it and it's not gonna, it's not gonna, you know, make a particular difference. It just means that the lightest light will be this sort of sepia toned, uh, kind of sepia toned, you know, kind of tan, whatever, orange, yellow, orange, ochre. Um, that will be the highlights, won't be any lighter than that. And that will help me with my illusion uh, that I'm going to try to paint with the tape. Just going over slightly, slightly darker, slightly more saturated. There, okay. So 
got a lot of standing water now and um, probably before I really start working, I need to let it dry a little bit, blot up some of the excess water, but certainly I can start working on these darker areas. So now I'm using Payne's Gray. And one can take, you know, one can use artistic license with this too, and you can add more color into it. Uh, but I just want it to look like an old photograph. Now I'm working with this kind of Payne's Gray on my uh, palette. Payne's Gray and Burnt Umber. So I'm just trying to replicate, going to the, clo the colors closest on the palette that resembles what I'm looking at in my um, reproduction. And that kind of yields these kind of darker earthy tones. And I'm working wet into wet. And it's an old kind of faded fuzzy photograph anyway. So that's not going to really um, jeopardize my painting if I just start working with those and blocking things in. And then I'll just layer over that. And I know I can get kind of dark around the edges of this of this taped area because uh, you know that's where the shadows are cast anyway. And then up here, um, getting this kind of fuzzy fuzzy curve from the edge of the frame. I might decide that my image could be kind of fuzzy in general, go for a kind of a fuzzy image and then a very crisp, really crisp def definition with the tape and then have kind of a fuzzy out of focus background photograph. That could be interesting. And that would still produce that effect, that trompe effect that I'm after. And all of this eventually will have, you know, browns and browns in it. Just kind of doing a ghost image to start with, because I'm just kind of waiting for things to dry, really. And it's pretty wet in the face. So I might just go back and um, blot away some of the standing liquids so just so that I can get to work quicker on more specific detail. Yeah, I'm inclined to let it dry just a little bit so that I'll have more control. So just picking up a little excess moisture so that it's not going to be a problem. There. Yeah, I'll let this dry and then, then I'll come in with a more deliberate kind of painting because I don't want to lose my image altogether or at least wait till it's damp. Okay, so I've started to block in this is Milkishman's face, and and now I'm I, I did the you know the negative space around around kind of framing her head and waiting you know for some of this to dry, but trying to use some of the moist paper to get kind of soft 
kind of bleeding color. And now I'm going to a slightly smaller brush and I'm trying to frame a little more. And then I think it's dry enough where I can start to clarify some of the facial features. And I'm gonna start with something, I'm not gonna start with the darkest dark or kind of a version of the darkest dark. So it's gonna be kind of a brown. I'm shaping my brush right now because I did, I think I did the wrong thing, which was leave it, you know, not in a good position. And now it's got some bristles hanging out. Okay, so now I'm just gonna start to block in some of the details. Once you get once you get the darks where they're supposed to be and it's not so scary. So I'll have some wet paint around here. So with her eye. There's highlights around it. Yeah, I'm just gonna almost like outline everything. Hold on just a second. Okay, back in action. So just getting in some of the darks. and try not to be too worried or concerned. Just following the map. and being careful not to with these things just have to be careful not to lose highlights if you got them and the softening the uh, softening the paint on the brow. Remember when you put the paint on, it's always going to dry a lot lighter. So one, sh one shouldn't be too concerned with how dark it's looking at first. So then the, the, this, these all just kind of become these overall puddles of paint. And initially the features, they might very well just kind of blend together into an overall dark shape. For instance, I'm just kind of connecting the darks. And it's really scary. I mean, I'm scared. But then I just have to remember, tell myself to just you know, follow through, see what happens. There. The initial, um, the initial applications are just, you know, just kind of fraught with doubt <laughs> about what's going to happen. So. Just laying in some shadows. 
and then it's really to my advantage not to be too specific. One thing I've noticed over here is that the, the background is lighter than the hair, the hair and the, like the ear, for instance, ears actually darker than the background. So waiting for the background to dry a little bit, but then the ear is gonna have to be darker. And so is the jaw. Which is kind of, kind of weird. That, that will all be dark. Okay, so let's see how this pattern is kind of emerging. And over here, there's some kind of shadows along the cheekbone. I'm going to, uh, I think at some point I might pan the camera a little bit just to see so the viewer can see what I'm looking at for my reference point. You're always just kind of gauging relationships. Wherever you're work, working, you're kind of just looking at relationships. And you can't really know how it's going to look exactly when you immediately when you put on the paint. It can't. It can't actually be finished. So you just have to kind of look at look at relationships. Try to keep them somewhat adjusted as you're going, and then you can modify later on. But um, I'm realizing, you know, that I, as this paint goes on, it can get much drier. It can get much darker, I, I mean. So there's not, not too much to worry about. She has a very kind of a crooked mouth. Oops. Little bits and pieces. you know, continuing to kind of try to connect all the dots in the space. I'm doing this thing where kind of making a mark to keep it, to keep everything kind of soft. I'm making a mark. Well, sometimes I'm painting in a wet paint. And sometimes I'm going back and softening the edge a little bit when I make a mark. So for instance, here where I made a mark, I'm going, I just clean my brush and I go back and soften that edge a little bit just so that it's doesn't have quite the quite the edge that it would otherwise. And then also this is in my reference photo, this is a very soft edge, so I'm also kind of going back and softening that just with a clean, a clean brush. I'm going to pan the camera out so then you can see what I'm looking at in terms of my reference.
Okay, now that my my reference image is included as well now too. So working up to the nose, nose is always a scary place to go. And I think primarily the thing is to get the to get the underside of the nose. And if you get the underside then And it kind of materializes. But it'll make a big difference once. The nose is always the, the elephant in the room. Where, you know, you, well, you can't just ignore it. It's just kind of focal point of the face. But just doing that is helpful. And again, I continue to soften my edges a little bit as I as I paint. And then joining the joining the eyes with then the bridge of the nose. And that kind of receding plane of the nose, that's another big kind of important area. There's a little bit going on on that side, but not so much. And then sometimes you have to you know make some marks and then go away and work on another area. For now I can go back to this eye, so kind of wet in here. Blotting some away there. There's kind of a highlight along the, that's a bone, you know, above the eye socket. So that's got to catch light. So I got to keep that edge. So I'm kind of, um, shaping that a little better. There. Down here it's, you know, relatively dry. So now I can come in and work a little bit under the chin. Put a darker value there and that will help Once the neck recedes a little bit. Then you'll have a, you know, you'll have a stronger reading of a face, what's going on with the face. And then I'll just having to be continually adjusting. You know, if my neck gets this dark, then I might have to go back and adjust the uh, her dress. So, but there, that's really helps the chin come forward when when you do the kind of the shadow under the chin. And then I'm going to do a darker mark here just to help define things. I think this is her collar over here.
And this is a nondescript dark over here. There. So, it's got white hair, but there's a little bit of a shadow. And then I believe that she has like a braid that she's that's pulled back, you know, for a bun or something in the back. So there's a kind of a line there. And that also is repeated over here. It's dark, dark. And a soft edge on that. And then this casts a soft shadow on the forehead. I'm using a number six brush now. It just gives me a little bit more control to work with. And I'm still alternating between uh, yellow ochre, Payne's gray, which is like a, almost like a really deep um, indigo blue, and then burnt umber, which is just a dark brown. Just alternating between those colors. I'm just trying to show how her hair is kind of bunching a little bit. And then, of course, it gets dark over here. And then there are just a few kind of highlights along this edge. There. This is the top of the ear that I, I want to remove a little bit there. Okay, so the face is starting to look somewhat formed. Um, the eye sockets are there. There's, you know, the nose is starting to look somewhat nose like. I just want to get in there and really really define those areas. Everything is so soft, so I keep finding myself wanting to kind of break up break up the line you know kind of soften the outline on my paint by doing that okay and the ear this is the ear over here
so vague. I don't want to draw too much attention to it. I just want to get it correctly drawn. One ear is lower than the other. Now that this is drawing, you can see the shadow on the face is darker than the background. That's probably important. And then in the hair, this will have to get darker eventually here where the hair is. So it doesn't look too bad. Soften that. Lift, lift a little bit. And then also the soften the soften the hair as well. Great, okay. So taking a break, a look at it, stepping away. Okay, so I'm winding down on the portrait part, trying to let everything dry. Usually you just have to let everything dry finally, just so you can get a clear sense of where you need to go back. I um, still want to do a little bit more dark around the eyes just to emphasize them. And then one final thing that I'm going to do is uh, going to do some glazing. And glazing just uh, helps to clarify everything. So I'm coming back in with this original uh, yellow ochre color that I was using to create sort of sepia ground. Yellow, it's maybe got a little tiny bit of red, kind of brick red mixed in with it. And then I'm going to go, uh, I'm just going to glaze over areas to try to just unify it a little bit, you know, so just kind of large swaths of glaze. And um, just kind of helps to simplify things a little bit. It'll, it'll sit down a little bit. It's nice to bring in that a little bit more warmth into these tones. I'll do one final glazing and then kind of assess if there's anything I need to do after that. You want to bring you you kind of want to bring it into the areas where there are shadows kind of helps to just clarify the shadow a little bit. I really like to get it into the eyes too. There's a lot of paint that's still wet in the eyes so I can't do a whole lot of glazing in there. Add add some of that color in there and then I'll come in one final time and um, create a little more definition. That shadow there. And chin under the neck. I picked up a little paint on that. I feel like it just, I, I feel like it just helps to sharpen it a little bit. And on the ear. And then I might want to come in one final time to just tweak it a little. But the uh, glaze kind of sort of loosens it up again too once you once you've been really tight with your strokes and everything. And then 
then this will help me see any kind of final adjustments that I might want to make. Maybe a few. Gonna soften it up just right there. And right there. And uh, probably one final round of marks, you know, just, just to clarify any anything where there's there's still a question. And I don't really feel compelled to have to do that everywhere. Um, possibly the blouse could be darker. But not too much darker. Just going to kind of let it naturally um, just kind of dissipate. So this dries. One final little bit of touch up, probably just for clarification. And then, then I'll leave it alone. Um, I wanted just uh, to point out how the nose evolved. You know, kind of first the shadow underneath, and then um, a couple secondary shadows. Just you know, the nose has sort of a series of planes, but there's this ball of the nose that projects out. That has to be defined, and then the nostrils occupy kind of a different plane. So if you can indicate those things, that's that's sometimes very helpful. And then, um, then anyway, <clears throat> the next step will be to thoroughly let this thoroughly dry completely, completely dry. And then um, once it's dry, then to remove the tape. And then the second round then will be just to um, kind of paint the uh, paint the, the, the faux tape or the illusionary tape into this, into this um, portrait and just see if I can kind of get that sense of, you know, the tape casting a shadow. Actually, one final step will be to paint some of these shadows yeah, I forgot all about that. I gotta, <clears throat> I gotta paint the shadows around where the where the tape is casting a shadow on the image. <clears throat> there, 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 there. That's gonna be really crucial. So before I lift the tape, that's one last step that I'll have to make before before I I, I literally peel the tape masking up and then and then go to work on the blue. So we'll see what happens. Let it dry, see what happens. All right. All right, so <clears throat> the last thing I'm gonna do to this painting before I take the tape off and then start with the kind of the, the top layer is to go along the edges and make shadows, uh, you know, the, so just to hold this, this is my reference point. I'm gonna make shadows along these edges before I take the tape off. So then they'll be nice and crisp along the edge. It'll be easier. I can always touch them up or perfect them, but right now I wanna I want just kind of create um, some shadows. So then my, my tape will separate and that will be the illusion. That'll be the trompe l'oeil. So I'm going to do that now. Mostly my painting is dry. Um, so I feel pretty confident. So I'm taking a little bit of a cooler pigment, just the pure Payne's gray. And then I'm doing a transparent wash over everything. Because I want, you know, I want whatever is underneath to show. I don't want to dissolve whatever is underneath. I still want it to show.
and then I'll try to try to make it maybe a little more intense, you know, where it's closer. We talked about in previous projects where it's closer to the object that's casting it, it gets darker. So it should be, you know, just a relatively transparent puddle. It will be dark in here. Okay, so then there's a little shadow that's cast on this edge. And there isn't there isn't a shadow everywhere. There are just a few places. And it kind of disappears over here. I've already added some over here, shadow over on this side. there and shadow cast over here. My paint's a little bit wet there, so I can't really do that. All right, uh, maybe up here a little bit. There's a very vague shadow up here. Then it goes right in next to the tape and then it comes out again. That's based on the tape either being close to the surface of the image or farther away. So where it's farther away, casts a bigger shadow. There, and I can't really do any more because it's wet down there. But once, uh, once I'm able to kind of complete this area, there might be a little bit of shading shadow over here, just a tiny bit. Not much. I don't want to outline it completely or else it won't look real. Now everybody's trying different things. No, not everybody's going to be doing this exactly, but I'm just trying to, you know, in terms of how you would treat something like this, um, I'm trying to offer some possibilities here. Yeah, not a not a not a complete outline or else I'll sort of defeat the purpose, but only kind of darker emphasis where where the the tape is kind of separating separating from the surface. Therefore that's what's going to give it a shadow. All right. All right, so I'll see how that looks. 
Got to let it dry. Remember to let the paper thoroughly dry. And then see where it's at and go from there. But um, my next step will then be to peel up the um, tape and then I can start on actually rendering rendering this tape that has highlights and shadows in it. And then that's, I'm gonna to try to make that look three-dimensional and that will be my illusion, my fool the eye. Okay, so this is, this is the end of the first demo. And then there will be a follow-up demo where, um, where we actually peel the tape up and then we go back and we paint this object on top, casting the shadow and we'll see what happens. Great.